warn the remote audience in advance that uh, I'm giving this from the local computer and we've been having some problems with it uh, freezing. So if it freezes, uh, it's not even my computer. There's just nothing I can do. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, you'll do that anyway. <laughs> I'm supposed to repeat that comment. Andre from the audience said, we will just start asking questions. <laughs> I know, exactly. So, right. So I'm going to tell you about elastic effect and, and some things that, yeah, really uh, surprised me in a very uh, nice way eventually once we understood them. So uh, I've worked on strontium ruthenate for many years. Uh, what I'm going to talk to, the work I'm telling you about today has involved the, the collaborators listed there. I'll try to cite individual papers and pieces of work so you'll see who's done what. Uh, the main thing to say is that most of my collaborators are at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, although there are a couple of uh, guys like Andreas Rost and Brad Ramshaw and Sayat Ghosh, who are now based elsewhere, who are based elsewhere. Uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, having theory collaborations on this project, particularly with Jörg and Marcus. Uh, and as you'll hear at the end of the talk, Bong Jai and Igor uh, joined the collaboration actually after seeing this talk a couple of weeks ago at, uh, at M squared S. So, uh, you know, it's, it's again demonstrating how useful it can be to go and give talks. So what I'm going to try and do is to tell you about uh, how we can tune through the Lifshitz transition, I say reliably, uh, in strontium ruthenate. Then I'm going to tell you about uh, two, well, certainly one new technique, the AC elastocaloric effect, which has uh, been a big, uh, uh, yeah, some, something of a surprise and uh, something that I think is, is really significant and as an experimental technique, and I'll explain to you why. Then I'll talk, that stuff has just been published. What I'll tell you about in the main bulk of the talk are stress strain measurements that have not yet been published. We're just in the process, the long process of writing them up. Then I'll draw some conclusions. And then people always ask me about superconductivity of strontium ruthenate. I can understand why. If I haven't been uh, used up all my time after 40 minutes, I can give you a quick short appendix on the superconductivity, but I'm not. Having seen the conference and how lively it is, I'm not so optimistic that we'll get to that. So, uh, based on the desire to study the superconductivity of strontium ruthenate, about 10 years ago now, Cliff Hicks proposed in our group then in St. Andrews that we might want to apply uniaxial pressure using a completely different approach to what had been done previously. So previously you would have clamps and a screw basically, uh, and you'd, you, it would be like almost a pressure cell without the medium where you're making direct contact between the anvils of the pressure cell and polished faces of a sample. One of the things you uh, absolutely can't do then is to apply tension. And one of the things we wanted to do to investigate thing, the issue of two component order parameters in strontium ruthenate was to tension. That caused Cliff to propose this way of doing uniaxial pressure, which was, you know, these things, I'm gonna give this talk quite experimentally, even though it's mainly a theory workshop, I think it's useful for people to hear how things really happen. Cliff was very used to uh, uh, the control and operation of PHO stacks because he'd done, as I always tease him about an eight or nine year PhD at Stanford building um, uh, scanning probe instruments controlled by PHOs. So he was pretty aware that it might be possible to do something like this, and what he said is, let's, instead of putting the, the sample in a pressure cell, let's glue it across the jaws of a vice. As it turns out, the properties of Stycast in high, hindsight are absolutely vital to this experiment actually working, but you, know, you make your own luck sometimes. So we're gonna glue the sample across the jaws of the vice, and we're going to have a bridge device such that if we lengthen the central stack and leave the other two untouched, we'll compress the sample. But in this bridge, if we lengthen the outer two stacks while leaving the inner stack uh, untouched, we will tension the sample. And, uh, and one of the tricks of it was that the sample was going to have to be very small because uh, what uh, piezo stacks are limited by is the force that they can apply, right? And so what you're wanting to do is to make the sample very small so that a small force controllably is giving you a very large pressure. Right now, and, and the reason you might think that that isn't going to work, and we had a lot of debates about it, 
is if you take a single crystal, you make it very thin and small cross-section, it's obviously quite a fragile thing. So you would intuitively think that you would break it as you tried to do this. And that's where the die cast comes in. Just from magic, it turns out that it's exactly the right softness. If it was any, much softer, it wouldn't transmit enough of the, for, uh, uh, of the force. Uh, well, it wouldn't trans, it would deform itself. So you would be deforming the die cast rather than the sample. If it was much harder, you would break the sample and it's just in the sweet spot. So the technique has worked very well. So uh, in terms of our study of the superconductivity, as I might go on to, we see absolutely no evidence for two component order parameter in the experiments that we do, uh, even though we set out to find it. And I guess it was pretty disappointing for some of the students who were, who were looking for it. But there was very big compensation because we discovered that we could uh, increase TC by over a factor of 2.4. And so you could take this traditionally 1.5 Kelvin superconductor and create a big maximum in its TC where it went up to 3.5. These are small numbers, but the factor is very big. Right? Many people, many experimentalists, including us, would love to find other superconductors where we could do the same. So, so that was really nice. Okay, first glitch with the local equipment. Yeah, even if I touch the keyboard, this is not happening. So if Marco could come in and stand, stand near the computer. <clears throat> no. Needs to be the local guy who stands there. Yeah, good, thanks, thanks, Sri. Okay. Not working from this. Oh, yes, it is. So, how does the tiger, is this tiger Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Oh, you're right, excellent, very good. Let's just see, Marco, stay. I may need you to stay. Yeah, because it's not. You moved, you moved just too far away. <laughs> um, so the pressures we can now reach are uniaxial pressures of about three GPA, but you've got to be very careful in doing that comparison because uh, if you, uh, in, in uniaxial pressure, you, the sample has the ability through Poisson's effect to relax in the transverse directions as you pressure in one direction. So for a given change in physical properties, more or less there's a factor of 10. You should be thinking of us now reaching uniaxial pressures, which have the same effects on a solid, but also symmetry breaking effects, but they have the same ability to tune the properties as about 30 GPA would in a, uniaxial, in a, in a hydrostatic cell. Of course, the great thing is that both go together. They're both, uh, you know, so now with uniaxial, you'll probably have the three principal axes of most samples plus hydrostatic pressure. And, uh, you know, the, the answers you get from those experiments should be related thermodynamically and you should be able to do those consistency checks. And we do, and they work out actually very well. It's almost uh, surprising. Great. So the, the next thing, again, just to try and get the superconductivity out of the way quickly before the appendix, uh, uh, it turns out that when Stuart Brown at UCLA saw this pressure cell, he became very interested in, in uh, studying the NMR night shift through TC in the pressured samples. Uh, he did that. He discovered he got very different results to a famous paper from 20 years ago on unpressured samples. So over a course of a year, he tuned the pressure off, thinking he was going to see some superconducting state transition. He never did. And the net result was that he discovered a key systematic error in that famous 20-year-old paper, which he corrected. And the Japanese group that published the original paper also corrected under you know, the sort of recipe he gave them. And that's had a huge effect on strontium ruthenate superconductivity. Because if you take seriously the data you would be able to see in these two papers, it's extremely difficult to imagine that it could be an odd parity spin triplet order parameter. So strontium ruthenate, um, particularly this paper in, in, in the follow-up paper in the National Academy of Sciences, if that result is correct, strontium ruthenate more or less has to be a spin singlet superconductor. And so certainly 
that's the way that many people in the strontium ruthenate field are now thinking. And it's a real revision of how you want to think about that superconductivity. Okay, but that isn't what I came to talk about. What I wanted to tell you about uh, is our interesting normal state physics properties that come on tuning through a Lipschitz transition. So uh, you can draw cartoons about what you're doing. And we certainly thought that when we maximized the TC at three and a half Kelvin, that was when we were uh, forcing ourselves to reach a Lipschitz transition. But kind of spectroscopically seeing is believing. So here's a beautiful experiment from Veronica Sunko and, and Cliff and Phil King's group, where on the left, you're seeing the original topology of the gamma sheet of strontium ruthenate. It's nearly a circle on this graph, and that's uncontroversial. Every photo emission group, when they study the bulk states, gets this. And then they developed a, a, a way of putting on enough uniaxial pressure. So here's a strain where we've gone beyond the Lipschitz transition. So the gamma sheet is now seen to be a strongly dispersing open 1D sheet with a different topology to the closed topology of the uh, circle. So that's you know textbook Lipschitz transition. You're, you're only doing it with uh, one of the uh, two uh, Lipschitz points, you know, uh, 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 symmetry uh, distinct Lipschitz points in the zone because what you're doing is you are oops, you are going you as you tune if you notice at the high pressure the gamma sheet has become first of all it becomes elliptical and then it opens part of that opening you can see that in the unpressured sample it's sitting closer to what is now the M1 point that it is after the strain has been, the uniaxial pressure has been applied. So it's moved away from one of the Van Hove points towards the other one. And now we've even gone through that and changed the topology. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is a, this is angle resolve photo emission. Um, and, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, what are we seeing here? This is an angle resolved photo emission experiment. And uh, there's always an issue in strontium ruthenate. You have both uh, bulk states and surface states, but you this this is actually, so the, the data here look a little bit fuzzy compared to the best photo emission, but that's because they worked uh, on very simple techniques to suppress the surface states altogether. So these are the bulk states of strontium ruthenate. Andre. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you went to DFT, uh, so yeah. So in energy units, uh, which uh, this is just kx ky in energy units, how much energy is that than that? Right. That's the question. Yeah, yeah. So, so from DFT, it would be about uh, 70 millivolts, but from experiment, the whole band is hugely renormalized. So it's about 13 millivolts, right? But, okay, now I won't go on to the bud because I want to finish the talk. Okay, that's, that's the answer, right? So, and we could uh, show ourselves from this spectroscopy that within our experimental errors, that sheet was touching the Lifshitz point when the superconductivity was maximized. Okay, so, so that was interesting. Now, what we wanted to do was to do thermodynamic measurements. I'm strongly of the opinion that we're only going to solve the issues of the superconductivity in strontium ruthenate if we can understand the thermodynamics. Another question at the back there? Yeah, so could, could I tell you what's happening along the gamma X line? Yeah, uh, what's happening is poor experimental resolution. I mean, I can show afterwards if people would like or privately laser photo emission data. Uh, it's better seen here. These are three distinct sheets, right? And there are some spin orbit coupling effects that give a little bit of distortion from the shapes you might have expected, but these are most definitely three sheets and uh, some fantastic laser photo emission data, which is extremely high resolution, which completely uh, establishes that. So does the Dahas van Alphen effect, actually. Okay. Right. Good. 
So I'm of the view that if we're going to solve the uh, superconducting state problem of strontium ruthenate, we really need thermodynamics to check the results of other measurements. So we were setting up to do some thermodynamics, uh, particularly heat capacity in the stress cells. That isn't a trivial thing because you have very, un A, you have very unusual high thermal coupling inevitably to your rig because you've, you've got to glue your sample hard to your rig. And then you have something which in a sense is even worse, which is that the way we apply the, the strain, obviously we go for a strain field which is uniform, about five to 10% strain and homogeneity in the middle of our samples. That's where we cut long bars. But what you actually have in a real sample is you have the uniformly strained region, a partially strained region. And then because we put contacts on to measure some other things, we have the sample sticking out into a hole beyond the glue. And that bit of the sample is completely unstrained. So if you just look at the heat capacity, which I always call the unspecific heat because it normally samples everything, then you would be sampling all of that. Yeah, the guy who spent years setting this up doesn't like that joke very much. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, so what he did was to use a very high frequency by our standards, AC technique. So you're at several kilohertz when you're uh, doing this. And if you're at several kilohertz, you pay some cost experimentally, but you restrict your heat to the uh, uh, uniformly strained part of the sample. But uh, more ex the way things really work, in order for him to get even respectable data from the heat capacity, he had, it turns out that the high frequency gives you a very small signal. So he needed extremely high setup, extremely high precision temperature measurement of the order of microkelvin per root hertz, right? And so we'll come on to his results in a minute, but that knowledge was extremely important to me because I then heard from uh, Matthias Ikeda, who just won a prize for this at LT, I think deservedly last week. He and Ian Fisher's group thought about uh, taking the elastocaloric effect to correlated electron systems. So conceptually, the elastocaloric effect is very closely analogous to the magnetocaloric effect that many, many more of you will have heard of. Uh, and so it says that if you can measure the strain derivative of the temperature as you're straining a sample, then you're getting information about one over its heat capacity as a function of strain multiplied by the strain derivative of its entropy. So that's uh, these, these, this is nice information to have. Now, the problem is that, uh, you know, people have used the elastocaloric effect in samples with huge elastic responses, right? That gives you a signal you can measure. But if you just try to do that DC, you have no chance of picking up the signal size, right? And what Matthias realized was that we were in some senses underusing the capability of these piezo stacks because he said, okay, we're applying a DC voltage and we're squeezing the sample with the DC by, by lengthening the stacks. We can turn this into an AC technique by applying an AC ripple voltage to the stacks themselves. So as well as the DC voltage, we're wiggling the stacks to and fro. That then gets us into all the signal to noise improvements of an AC measurement. And he had a very nice rev science just demonstrating exactly how this technique was going to work. He's been applying it to personally to pernictide superconductors. So I knew that because we had sensitivity to burn on our delta T, we would probably have a very nice signal from strontium ruthenate in the setup that we had. And indeed, uh, I don't think it does anybody any harm to look at uh, raw data sometimes. So we have a, a PPM, part per million applied strain amplitude here. That is giving us a total signal uh, uh, as we vary the strain, which is varying over the range of about one and a half milli K. And you know, the meaning of a micro Kelvin per root Hertz noise level is that you don't see any noise on that signal at all to what your naked eye, that's all signal. Okay, so, and you know, this was, this was uh, very rewarding because we didn't have to set this all up. We'd even done it already. So it was very nice indeed. So what you can do is to, oops, sorry. Here's a couple of sweeps of uh, uh, at a cut sweeps at a couple of temperatures. This is the result of 73 sweeps at a whole series of temperatures, constant temperatures between eight Kelvin and one Kelvin. And all we've done so far, it's uncalibrated. We're just plotting the measured delta T uh, uh, for the very small wiggle strain we're plotting against temperature and strain. 
And it's a little bit blurred out on the on the, the the projector here, but I think you can see there's a huge information content in this graph, right? So first of all, if you plot it like this with zeros in white, then what you're finding are the zeros, and the zeros in the elastocaloric effect are coming because of extrema in the entropy, right? So ds d epsilon is going to zero where you get that zero. So that, that white line there is the extremum in the entropy coming, as I'll show you in a minute, from the peak in the entropy that you see when you uh, go into, when, when you're going through the Van Hove point. You notice that that peak in the entropy is turning into a dip in the entropy in the superconducting state. The superconductor is very good at stealing the Van Hove entropy. And then you also see the white lines tracing uh, what turn out to be TC. And we know that's TC from susceptibility, but also we were actually doing this experiment in a way that we were measuring the heat capacity and the elastocaloric effect on the same sample. So there's the heat capacity TC. And so obviously the elastocaloric effect has very uh, well traced the superconducting dome, if you like, of strontium ruthenate. Now there's a star up here, yellow star. And what it's showing is that is the single point that we knew from our MUSR colleagues uh, to be the TC of the entry into some form of magnetic phase. It's a phase uh, in which they see uh, MUSR oscillations. Right? And they, their interpretation is that it's some form of a density wave phase. It may be, but I just want to say it's some form of a magnetic phase. What's nice here is that we have, again, maybe a little bit blurred on this view graph, but here we don't have zeros. We have a dark line, which seems to be the line tracing probably a set of first order transitions that uh, correspond to, to that magnetic phase. Yeah. Andy, so... I thought in the past people did neutron scattering in elastic neutrons and found, uh, you know, some peaks in the incommensurate spectra, yeah. but not quite evidence for long range. That's that's theory. correct. And so, um, and now I heard at M squared S that uh, Keimer's group are doing. Uh, so we've we've collaborated a lot with Keimer on taking uniaxial pressure into, say, X-ray scattering. So they now have Rick's data showing that the inelastic peak is softening a lot. They're not at these temperatures yet. They're, 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 for their, they're scanning at temperatures above this phase, but as they scan through those ranges of strain, it's softening a lot. So it looks like it's going to be a density wave of static order at that Q or close to that Q. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things which is interesting from this, just raw data analysis, right, is that uh, strontium ruthenate plotted against these tuning parameters is seen to have a phase diagram pretty similar to those of other unconventional superconductors. It's going to be very interesting to see how exactly the superconductivity and the magnetism exist below one Kelvin. Uh, that's going to be harder to calibrate. So we do have some data, but we're going to be working on that and publishing something over the next year, I hope. Yeah, there is data. I'm going to show you right now what the data is of the entropy at this transition. Right. So all of that's un uncalibrated, right? But I insisted that before we uh, publish this, we need to find a calibration. That was an involved affair. It took us a couple of years to be convinced. Andreas Ross really solved it. So then we were able to calibrate our data. So now we're seeing raw elastocaloric data in blue. But it's not raw, really raw anymore because that's the Gruneisen parameter in proper units. I mean, it's a dimensionless quantity, but it's in proper numbers as far as we can get it. Then it's a numerical issue in order to extract simultaneously the heat capacity and the entropy from that raw signal. And the entropy that you're seeing is shown in black, right? So there's the peak in the entropy um, above TC in the Van Hove. Uh, because of the Van Hove singularity, you see it sharpening. Here, you see that if you just model the background over that range of strain with some you know, simple polynomial or some simple function, uh, there's no deviation from that background. If you do it below, at the temperatures below which we begin to see that peak in the Gruneisen parameter, the entropy uh, signal corresponding to that peak is a drop in the entropy of about, by four Kelvin, about three millijoules per mole Kelvin squared, 
uh, below what the entropy was going to do if you had just continued the elastocaloric effect smoothly the way you did there. Okay, now that looks rather broad, but we do have some strain in homogeneity, and within the strain in homogeneity that we can model, that is the breadth you would expect for something that was sharp. Now, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm adherent to the idea this is a first order transition, as is Jurg. Cliff doesn't necessarily agree, so let's just leave it as saying it is a thermodynamically traceable effect, which causes the loss of about three millijoules per mole Kelvin squared of entropy. Okay. So it is, I, I would be much better off of, of now, what have I lost? Uh, I'll be much better off showing you this afterwards. I'll be very glad to. Yeah, Andre is asking about how the line looks. It needs to be at higher resolution and the actual figure is much higher resolution than that. And then you can examine that and we can talk about it. So, yeah, no, it's different because the line is going down like this. So the line, if it intersects the superconductivity at all, it's intersecting it very near the edge of the superconducting dome, and we don't quite know how it intersects. That's the take-home message here, right? And, uh, um, yeah, there's a lot I could say, but we'll do it later, hopefully. Okay, good. How much time do I actually have? Because you had to adjust for the uh, loss. 16 minutes, okay, good, right. Let's speed up a bit. So the elastocaloric effect is great. And in principle, you could use it to combine any spectroscopy that you're doing from the top side of that sample. If you've got a thermometer on the back side of your sample, you can in principle get spectroscopic and thermodynamic data simultaneously. Hasn't been done yet, but it will be done because I'm determined that we do it and that would be very nice. Okay, now on to what I really wanted to talk about. Is a recent unpublished work, and this is uh, on the stress strain uh, characteristics of strontium ruthenate as you go through this Lifshitz point. So this is a big technical development that Cliff had been working on for a long time. In our original strain cell, we had a displacement sensor, so we were seeing roughly what the strain of the sample was. Now he's designed something where we have two sensors of displacement and a force sensor. So we can simultaneously measure the stress and the strain, and so therefore look at things like elastic moduli. Very important thing is that we wouldn't be able to get this technique to work experimentally if we weren't able to make use of our focused ion beam machining that we have in our group, very fortunately, to really prepare the next part of the sample properly. That's just a little technical point. So Hillary Node did this experiment, and at four Kelvin, this is what she saw. And it surprised the heck out of me. At least at first it didn't surprise me because I hadn't thought hard enough. And then when I thought hard, it started to surprise me, right? Because what she sees is an absolutely huge effect. You go through this Lifshitz transition and the, the thing softens by 15% at four Kelvin, right? And it also has a very strong temperature dependence to which we'll return. But the reason, and, and we also know that the, uh, the, 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 the lowest point of the dip within our experimental resolution comes at the Lifshitz strain. So we're pretty confident that this is the strain through the Lifshitz transition. Now, that's intuitively surprising. And why? Because uh, all electrons contribute. This is a bonding issue, right? This is a softening of the overall lattice all electrons contribute to the stiffness of a lattice. And you know this, that logic about the Lifshitz transition would say the conduction electrons are dominating this huge change in, this, in the lattice softness. So I see Malthus in the audience. Uh, he gave this uh, elegant uh, theater analogy uh, yesterday about who's the, who's the actor and what's the stage and everything. I'm a, a less erudite person. So the way I look at this is to say, you know, all of these electrons should be contributing to the bonding. And in fact, the way we physicists think is that here's where we do the physics and here's where they do the chemistry, right? It's a very direct thing, okay? And uh, um, 
Yeah, so it's very surprising because this result seems to be telling you that you're in the physics part of the energy landscape and you're making this huge change. So you'd say to yourself, how can that be? At least I said to myself. That it's true is proved by, I mean, Jörg would say you can prove other ways, which is true, but seeing again is believing. Because we knew the entropy from the elastocaloric effect, we could look at the entropy relative to the Young's modulus. I think any sane person would say they're pretty closely linked, right? And if we go back, the none of the chemistry bands can give you any electronic entropy because they don't cross the Fermi level. We are at temperatures below the phonon characteristic phonon scales. There's very, you know, the phonons are only contributing 5% of the heat capacity at four Kelvin. So it's not the phonon term. So it seems to be really strong indication that it actually is the conduction electrons that are messing with the chemistry here, right? And so then, uh, you know, or even before, uh, Jörg had been thinking about these kind of things and Marcus, and so we had the theory that they had developed to help us interpret the elastocaloric effect, which I should have cited, which was really fantastic in that elastocaloric project. All they needed to do then is a bit like our bit of luck with that. They had the theory already to start trying to analyze this. So, and what they see is that the elastic constants are the second strain derivative of the free energy, right? And so you can, you write down a model for the gamma band, which we knew uh, for its dispersion constrained experimentally. Take this, write down the free energy, take its second derivative, and that tells you that this is the elastic constant of the gamma band and it's negative, right? And there's, there's a key point, right? So you can turn that simple gamma band only model into a much more sophisticated model, uh, which incorporates all the chemistry by adding a constant. This constant is C lattice, right? This is the background uh, of all the other chemistry. And so what we're actually seeing here is that the conduction band negative term is able to compete with the summed contribution of everything else, right? And uh, yeah, so there we go. Now, um, and now that's what you can write down or you can write down very easily is about the lattice constant. We are measuring the Young's modulus and there's a numerical issue here that you then need to be very careful about nonlinear Poisson's ratios as you go close to the young to the Lipschitz transition to get the right Young's modulus out of your calculation. And this was so, you know, Jörg always tells me you can't trivialize what I've done too much, right? And so this was actually uh, not at all trivial. Um, and it's very gratifying because there's what the model does. Uh, and he's tried very hard to constrain the model experimentally to get predictions in absolute units as well. So there's the model in absolute units, there's the data. I mean, obviously the data have a bit of broadening that the model doesn't have and everything, but it's pretty good. There's, yeah. Yeah, no, almost none. Well, the input parameters, uh, there's almost no free parameters in the theory because the input parameters all come from experiment. Right, and so uh, what they're doing is we have the dispersion, and we basically know that in the end the dispersion is like it's it's constrained by photo emission, right? So we we know it and das van Alphen, and we know it's very similar, a bit like uh, Malta was saying that yesterday. It's very similar to just a, a numerically scaled renormalization of the whole gamma band, but we've put that in, and then crucially you put in what is the strain at which you see the van the the Lifshitz transition. And that's, that is very much concerned with how big is this prefactor. But you, and the prefactor, yeah, you see the logarithm and you think it's all going to be the logarithm, but the prefactor is anomalously large. And after speaking with Igor Mazin, we now understand why the prefactor is anomalously large. If I get time, I'll mention that. Okay. But, but you know, without that extra insight, everything was experimental. So, you know, it's not trying to fit to our data. No, it's just taking experimental data, but other things, using that in the model to calculate this quantity and getting the right answer. Yeah, you're welcome. So everything's well produ re reproduced. And the, you know, for me, in a sense, this is superfluous, but uh, you know, the, the visual impact of this entropy and Young's modulus uh, graph is so high 
that it's very nice to see that it's you know almost exactly at least qualitatively reproduced by the theory. So the theory has to be right, I would say. So it's really true that a single conduction band in this case ends up with a negative contribution to compressibility, which is overcoming what the rest of the conduction bands are doing and all the valence bands. And that to us was very surprising. Uh, now, this temperature dependence, I said I'd come back to it. So this is what it would be predicted to be in the simple theory, because you're at the Lifshitz strain. And that is a prediction that says that it's got this very strong downward curvature, which is also seen in the experiment. So there again, it's just an honest comparison. We haven't tried to fit numbers to numbers here. That has implications because it turns out that that logarithmic term would be capable of becoming negative and divergent as t went to zero. So what you're saying is that in principle, a boring Lifshitz transition could give you quantum critical elasticity, right? And uh, again, you know, we hadn't thought about this until we started looking at this da these data and thinking about this problem. Of course, in reality, something intervened. We know here that superconductivity intervenes. So the question is, what does superconductivity do? But yeah, uh, so here is uh, the. Uh, the Lifshitz, the Lifshitz elasticity as a function of, or the Young's modulus as a function of temperature taken in a field of two Tesla to suppress the superconductivity going down. That's where TC of the sample at this relative Lifshitz Van Ho strain is. And here's what you see when you've done the experiment uh, uh, with, uh, with the field taken off. So now the superconductivity probably has to make a PPM softening of the lattice, I think, right at TC. But the main thing it's doing is it's hardening the lattice. So it's stealing the Van Hove entropy and it's hardening the lattice again. So superconductivity is a thing which can intervene to get rid of this kind of effect. Anyway, this was very thought provoking uh, for us. And we start wondering whether uh, avoiding elastic catastrophes can, you know, can be quantified as a way of giving superconductivity in systems like this. Jörg also, in about uh, a couple of hours, started to write down scaling relations for the generalized free energy that you would have for a generalized strain tune transition. And he realized that uh, it's like, uh, I'm told to say this is like in picking physics, right? That when you've written in that scaling form, you have a, a, a quantum, um, uh, uh, whatever, like in picking criterion, that says that if those uh, uh, indices or in this uh, calculation get to be less than two, then you're actually guaranteed to have a finite temperature lattice instability because of that, the existence of that physics. We have the marginal case and you know, we have a very simple system. It's a 2D saddle point. So you can say you genuinely know, and we can quantify how 2D it is. And it's, you know, the dispersion's only of a couple of Kelvin. So, it's, uh, so we know these exponents Therefore, we're at the marginal case where the instability would be a t equals zero instability, but you know, you can show that it would be the t equals zero instability. So uh, that's uh, the story on this. This was very, very educational to me. Uh, as I say, wasn't surprised at all when I first saw it because I didn't know anything. Then I started thinking and we all started thinking and I was incredibly surprised then we kind of taught ourselves the answer and you're a bit less surprised again. But I think the middle state is the good state to be in. This is a pretty surprising observation that under any circumstances at all, conduction electrons can do something like this to the elastic properties of a solid. So that was very good. How much time do I have? Do you want to hear? Okay, well, I've got five minutes. I'll go on and say a couple of things about the superconductivity and our approach. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Com completely correct. Yeah. Yeah. But but. Uh, so okay. So it's taken into account by nature. To the extent that the experiment and the theory are doing you know, close enough to the same thing that it is taken into account. Actually, the, the strontium ruthenate is incredibly 2D. We've known that the out-of-plane dispersion of the gamma sheet is a 
Kel a couple of Kelvin ever since um, old DHVA days. But even Stuart Brown's work, and we have some other work which I didn't have time to talk about, they're all showing you that the dimensional crossover is just coming, it's becoming, uh, would become relevant only below the superconducting TC. So superconductivity is the first thing that intervenes. Origi eventually it would, right? You're not perfectly 2D, but you're very, very close to 2D. So it's this kind of incredible model system for studying this kind of physics. Okay. Oh, and, and, and on the question there, in case I didn't repeat the question, uh, Malta's question was about the dimensionality. I hope that's clear to the online audience. Andre. Yeah. And of course, change of time is pretty small, right? Yeah. 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 Which is, is it clear from the data that it's really logarithm rather than some regular temperature dependent in a finite range? So, so from the data, no. And you wouldn't really expect it to be because I'm giving this approximate. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, Andre's saying, are we really seeing a logarithm in that experimental data? Uh, well, it, it, honestly speaking, uh, if you really look at it, probably not quite, right? But then that's not so surprising because we're now getting down to four Kelvin uh, and our dimensionality scales of the order of two Kelvin. So it's not killing us in a very visibly obvious way, but it's beginning to have an effect is the way that I would, I would say. So yeah, we aren't a perfectly 2D system, but we are enough of a 2D system to be able to see very surprising things. Right, and then make you think of other surprising things. Okay. And now your other question, where was it? I may have put the wrong, Doo -doo -doo. yeah. One of the things that we did recently with Igor and Bunjai Kim was they were, you know, DFT, can investigate this. So imagine that our, our assumption of C lattice being uh, strain independent wasn't true. But I think the entropy kind of rules that out already, but uh, they went away and did the full DFT first principles calculation and found this about the scale of dip that we find. So certainly, you know, Igor's a, a, a skeptical guy and a careful guy. His conclusion is that, yeah, he, this is a believable story from the DFT point of view. DFT also tells you a bit about this prefactor because so there is um, something called Anderson's theorem, but that's Ole Anderson, not, uh, not uh, Phil. And that's telling you about the, uh, the, the power law dependence of hopping parameters when the hopping is going between orbitals of, uh, of different kinds. And it's to do with the angular, I, mean, I don't understand this in detail, but the, the, the point is it's to do with the angular momentum of the orbitals. And here we're doing, um, the hopping is ruthenium, oxygen, ruthenium. So we're doing two hops between a D level and a P level. And it actually turns out that that gives you a power law dependence of the distance uh, um, uh, function, functional form of the distance dependence of the hopping parameter, which actually matches a dimensionless number that we had been puzzled about from our analysis very nicely. So we think that that's the other key thing is strontium ruthenate is also, uh, you know, if you were doing SP hopping, then we'd be a factor of 10 down in that number that comes in squared to the elastic constant. So we'd have lost a factor of a hundred, right? And so we believe we can understand this now. Now I don't have five minutes anymore. <laughs> Negative one, but there's four minutes. Well, okay, but uh, I mean, we don't have to, do you want me to, oh, okay. I'm being told to go on, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I won't go on. Yeah, I will. So one of the other experiments we've been doing now about the superconductivity was a heroic effort uh, experimentally to build a huge strain rig to allow MUSR to be done under strain in strontium ruthenate because 
We heard from Aaron about the care effect being interpreted as time reversal symmetry breaking at TC. MUSR also has a signal uh, looking like an internal field at TC. And uh, you know our MUSR colleagues uh, insisted on drawing this MUSR phase diagram for strontium ruthenate. Uh, I particularly enjoyed that part, part by the way, but anyway. Um, uh, so let's look at what the elastocaloric effect tells you. It actually tells you that all qualitative features of that kind of educated guess of a phase diagram are obeyed, except that there is absolutely no sign thermodynamically of this line uh, for time reversal symmetry breaking. Now, they are predicting a very, very weak strain dependence of that, so the elastocaloric signal would be small. But what we can also do is the heat capacity coming down in temperature at different strains. That should pick things up perfectly well. I'm showing you the heat capacity transitions that we see there. They show no convincing sign of splitting at all, just a little bit of broadening. USR tells us exactly the temperature range we should be looking at in every strain to see a second transition. That is circled there. And within probably 5% criterion, we do not resolve any thermodynamic signature of a second transition there. So uh, to me, what that tells you is that you've got to be very careful. Uh, when we use the term phase diagram, when we draw diagrams like this, the assumption that everybody has either implicitly or explicitly is that these are the boundaries of bulk equilibrium thermodynamic phases. That's why I think it's extremely important to investigate that kind of stuff uh, with thermodynamics and we're getting a negative answer. And, uh, you know, and, and so it's really important that we see what the care effect does under strain in future. And as Aaron said, we have the aspiration to do that, but certainly the mu -SR doesn't tie in with what we're doing thermodynamically. Now this very final slide. Uh, yeah, okay. The other thing, by the way, that our entropy inversion tells us from the elastocaloric is that the gap function of strontium ruthenate just has to be fully gapped at the Van Hove points, right? So it rules out any order parameter which has put nodes there. And, and, and Jürgen Marcus did a, a nice calculation, illustrative calculation proving that, I think. That's in the supplementary information of the elastocaloric paper. Now we have something else about strontium ruthenate, which is very suggestive, which is that ultrasound, which is nominally a thermodynamic probe as well, it shows jumps in elastic constants that should not jump unless you have a two component order parameter, right? And so that's a very interesting uh, result indeed. However, where they found the jumps are in the C66 parameter. Everything I've showed you so far has been straining along the, bond, the zone edge in K space, and that has nothing to say about a C66 anomaly. With uniaxial pressure, we can also pressure along the one one direction, which we're doing in some depth at the moment. And, uh, you know, that's, a, that's great. It's purportedly a thermodynamic measurement. There should be thermodynamic consequences. And the, 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 the message at the moment is that there are, again, big discrepancies between what we get with the bulk measurements and the numbers that are coming out here. You also notice, by the way, there's a factor of 35 in jump height difference between these two uh, different ways of doing ultrasound. And you know, if, if this jump is supposed to be Ernfest related to the jump in, in the heat capacity, so that also should worry us, I would say. So, you know, my, now we get from fact to fiction, my, my personal bias at the moment is that it's going to wash out in the end that strontium ruthenate is a single component, even parity order parameter. That's probably where we're headed, but, you know, we need to really, really nail that down over the next few years before we can be certain about that. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you. Questions from the audience? Uh, I'll jump on the very last phrase that you pronounced, even parity, single component, even parity order parameter. Uh, two questions. Yeah. One very specific. Is it D-wave in your opinion or, or not? 
In my opinion, yes. it's D wave. In my opinion, it's DX squared minus Y squared. Let me, that's Very my good. opinion, Very right? Good. But let's just see. Not the only person in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask a little but, bit but more. But could I, could I say one thing very quickly there? Mm -hmm. The thing which survives completely is the disorder dependence of the TC of strontium ruthenate. So it has to be a sign changing order parameter because every single way you disorder these crystals, you destroy the superconductivity completely. And second, it's the last day of conference, I will ask some semi-philosophical question, uh, which is mostly for theorists, but you know, you qualify as theorists as well. Uh, so <laughs> an honor. Question, let, me, let, let me go to the question. <laughs> question is this, uh, you know cuprates, and we know there is one whole point in the cuprates. Yeah. And there was a number of theory papers saying that that one whole point is the best case for both magnetism and, super, and D wave superconductivity. Yet TC is almost zero at one half point. It's the very end point of all this wonderful superconducting phase diagram. Why is there one half is nothing for superconductivity? And here it's everything. Okay, so uh, if you listen to your colleague, your theory colleague, Peter Hirschfeld, and another honorary theorist, Dave Bruden, they would say that that's because it's very highly disordered by the time you've driven it to the Lifshitz point. Yeah. So that's the first point. Uh, the second thing is, it's I've been tearing my hair out for nearly 10 years that we should be working on cuprates, and I'm really motivating people now to go to the lanthanum strontium system. Uh, what we can at least do is to start at slightly cleaner, lower order levels of disorder and drive it the rest of the way by strain and then end up studying the disorder dependence of what happens in some kind of a controlled way. That would be really interesting. The other point about the cuprates, though, is that you always have this diamond square issue, right? The, 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 the diamond Fermi surfaces are very go very close to the Van Hove point. The square ones are very far from the Van Hove point. And you, know, you get just as good superconductivity in the cuprate families where the Fermi surface is square as you do when it's, when it's uh, uh, diamond shaped. Again, though, we should just be going to investigate that. I mean, the other thing I believe is that in strain terms, as I mentioned this, we've been talking today about about up to 0.8% lattice parameter changes. But the yield strain of most materials is way higher than that. So you know, that's the other thing I'm trying to motivate the people doing the hard work to do. We can probably put three or 4% strain into these materials in eventually. So I would love to take some square Fermi surface to cuprate superconductors and see what happens to them under high enough strain. Andy, let me ask one question about this ultrasound evidence. Yeah. So if you had a scenario in which by accident, one superconducting, a single component superconducting state and a non-superconducting state happen to have condensing at the same point, would you see an anomaly in C66? And a non-superconducting yes. state. Yes. So that might be that, a way to Yeah. Fight. Okay, good. Um, I don't know. Uh, my guru on this is Jörg, who, who might be on the call. I'm going to say I doubt it, but... Is so. Jörg, are you on the call? I told him not to because it would be boring. Okay, he took me seriously. <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. yeah. So did you hear Sri's question, Jörg? Yes, I did. I don't think it would work because you need uh, two order parameters that, uh, that have to be gauge invariant in their combination. So if it's non-magnetic, you have a psi star and something else that doesn't have a face that couples to strain. So, so the, I mean, uh, the received wisdom is that it needs to be two superconducting order parameters. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's a question in the, I don't see any questions from people. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Then I'll get back to the online participant. Thanks for the nice talk. I have a, a very naive question, which is related to the fact that if you have a two component order parameter and there are two different Dissymmetry uh, irreducible representations, when both of them have condensed, you expect to be in a different symmetry group. Uh, you expect to be in a lower symmetry group. Now, is that not something that uh, it would show up if you did some very simple experiment like Bragg diffraction? The crystal lattice constants would not change. So, one of the things that's taken me far too long to really appreciate is that symmetry is useful but there's always got to be an energy scale associated with any symmetric effect. 
And it's the energy scale which is going to tell you whether you have observables associated with it, right? And and so that's that's the key point. You need to really be careful that it's. Uh, and this is why it's you know you do some incredibly sensitive experiment uh, that can find you like what David Shea is doing, right? He's finding symmetry anomalies in many things, right? But until he knows or we all know the energy scale associated with those observations, we just don't know whether they're significant or not. So, so that's my answer there. So there's one question from John Cooper. Uh, would you like to speak up, John, or shall I read your question? Read it, Can please. You... Read it, he said, okay. please. So he said, uh, towards the end, you showed specific heat jumps at TC versus negative strain. How do they vary with positive strain? Uh, so um, I, I don't have the graph with me, John, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the the strain dependence of TC measured um, magnetically is nearly even, right? So it's flat bottomed uh, and it, it goes up almost quadratically, uh, both under tension and compression. We have a, we've followed it a slight way under tension, but the thing about tension is the samples break much more easily under tension. So uh, we're always a bit, uh, if we're not particularly interested in tension, we tend to avoid it because we want to then do a long experiment instead of a short one. Okay, thank you. Great, okay, let's thank Andy for a beautiful talk.